Well, I, I think this is part of why you see some of the tension you see developing uh, in terms of insurgent candidates, both on the left and the right. Uh, if this was World War II, you go back to 9-11, this would be 1955. Now, if we were still fighting Imperial Japan in 1955, we'd be a totally different country. I mean, one of the reasons World War II is in many ways a satisfying war is it ends very quickly, ends less than four years. We're now in the middle of 14 years of warfare. It's getting worse, not better. Uh, there's, there's no reasonable grounds to believe that Iraq is capable of being stabilized without probably an Iranian-led dictatorship. Uh, Afghanistan is in permanent danger of decay. Uh, and the risk of taking out the refugee parts of Pakistan is the disintegration of Pakistan, a country which probably has somewhere between 80 and 200 nuclear weapons. So you, you start somewhere around Pakistan and swing across through the collapse of Somalia. I, just, I did a novel last year on uh, duplicity about a uh, Somali-American running for Congress in Minneapolis while his brother is the number two leader in al-Shabaab. We just found out last week that a Somalian who is charged with being a war criminal is actually a security guard at Dulles. Um, and that there are probably, between the various places on the planet that have produced war criminals, there are probably about a thousand in the United States uh, at the present time. But that includes Guatemala, El Salvador, Croatia, I mean, a lot of places you have to be a war criminal on the current planet. So, so you have this problem that we have no, we have no general theory for the war. We're not allowed to talk honestly about the war, which is clearly religiously driven. I mean, you cannot describe what's happening from, from Boko Haram in Nigeria, across Al-Shabaab in Somalia, up through ISIS, to Al-Qaeda, to the Taliban, uh, and then say, let's treat this as a secular problem. These are people who, you know, had bad childhoods. It's just not true. In, in a lot of cases, not even poor. Bin Laden came from the second richest non-royal non family in Saudi Arabia. So nobody wants to deal with the real problem, which is going to be here for a long time. Uh, I think this is a 70 to 100 year war. I think we are totally unprepared for a campaign of that scale. And I think that it's, it'll get worse before it gets better. And you see this happening in Europe, which is going to, which is going to get steadily worse. I mean, Europe right now is in the early stages of an enormous crisis of identity. Uh, and I think that it will lead to just tremendous tension. And we have no language to describe what's happening. You're not watching refugees. I mean, this is all legalistic, academic language from a different world. You're, well, you're seeing migrations like the Central Asian migrations that drowned the Roman Empire. And the number of people, and by the way, there's no particular rationale for why we accept people from Syria. We accept people from Syria because they can get to the water where they can get picked, they can get photographs. I mean, otherwise, why didn't Darfur deserve the same opportunity? I mean, to tell me the rationale, why Syrians? The collapse of Libya means, by the way, that the number of people coming north out of sub-Saharan Africa is gonna go up dramatically, already has. Hundreds of people are dying trying to cross the Mediterranean to get to Italy, uh, for a practical reason. Nigeria has a population explosion. Nigeria, by the end of the century, may have the same population as all of Western Europe. So you're a young Nigerian. You watch television. You think, Rome, Lagos. Rome, Lagos. Unless you're insane, you pick Rome. Now the question is, how do you get there? Well, with the collapse of Libya, there's no intervening state to slow you down. So these are the kind of problems that are building, and that's why you're gonna see national security be a bigger and bigger debate in this country, and you're gonna see the establishment version, bipartisan establishment version collapse, because it has no answers. It cannot possibly solve this problem. Now, the Bush program didn't, the Obama program didn't, and there's no establishment solution that'll work. Thank you for the encouraging news on that. So, <laughs> speaking of uh, challenging childhoods, what about the fellow in uh, North Korea? What should we uh, think about him and, and the 
the direction that's taking. I think that I think the term "be afraid" is a really good phrase. Well, you know, I'm, I I came out of a background. My dad spent 27 years in the infantry. I got involved in this stuff in October in August of 1958 because I was really worried about our civilization collapsing. Uh, and one of my early goals was the defeat of the Soviet Empire. Uh, and I really did think in 91 came much earlier than I thought it would. Uh, but I really did think that we had an opportunity to create a dramatically more orderly world coming out of the collapse of the Soviet Empire. And it's clear in retrospect I was just wrong. Uh, and so you're gonna have all of these pressures built and you have exactly the case of North Korea. We have weapons of mass destruction of, of which the most frightening is, is, is electromagnetic pulse because it potentially covers a larger part of the country and knocks out our civilization as we know it by, break, by, by destroying the electricity capabilities. Uh, my co-author, Bill Fortune, wrote an absolutely brilliant book called One Second After, which is a novel about a small town in North Carolina after an EMP attack. And if, if you read it, you have a sobering sense of how real this problem is. Uh, you have to assume the North Koreans are technically smart, even if they are utterly crazy. Uh, and they are crazy. I mean, they live in a, essentially an 11th century theocratic kingdom, uh, which is totally isolated from the world. And the amount they understand about the rest of the world is amazingly small. And in fact, when people flee North Korea, they go into a state of shock because they're entering a world they didn't know existed. Um, it's, it's very dangerous. I mean, no, nobody should kid themselves. This, this is a place where, and they have enough conventional artillery and rockets, forget nuclear, they have enough conventional artillery and rockets within range of Seoul that they could shatter Seoul in three hours. And even with the Israeli kind of Iron Dome, you couldn't cope with the volume of fire. So North Korea is a real problem. And, and again, it's why I think you've got to have a, a more uh, intensely realistic sense of, of, of what you're trying to do. It means you've got to have a very secure uh, ballistic missile defense system. And you probably have to have a space based one that shoots missiles down before they get anywhere near space because if they ever get an electromagnetic pulse vehicle uh, over the United States, they literally could take out half the country's capacity for electricity with one weapon. And this, this stuff is a very big problem. Okay, well, let's, let's, we better turn to domestic policy. It's, it's less, <laughs> maybe less functional, but it's a slightly less dangerous unless you're driving, trying to drive on the freeway. So, uh, you know, so on that subject, uh, we, running the Bay Area Council, we're a group that, that cares about the, our region and the future of our state. And we were used to historically uh, having the federal government support areas like infrastructure and education. And, you know, it seemed like the federal government was the place to go to get help and support and matching funds and build a clean water system and those things. But now we say, don't even bother going to Washington because you know, Washington's not there. And there hasn't been that much discussion in the campaign about this. I mean, what, what's your view? Is, is Washington, uh, you know, is, what's the reason that Washington has taken the position that it seemingly has of distancing itself from these issues, if you agree that it has? Well, I think part, it's of, our sense. I mean, part of it is that conservatives don't like to spend money, and liberals prefer spending money on the welfare state. So when you go in and you say, would you like to spend the next, you know, billion dollars on some program for the poor, or would you like to spend it building a, a high-speed rail? The, the bias on the Republican side is to spend neither, and the bias on the Democratic side is to spend it on people. And you've, you've seen a steady erosion of our commitment. Same thing's true for national security. If you, if you look at the size of national security in the budget as late as the 1970s, or early 1980s, it was amazingly bigger than it is now. If you were to look at the investment portion of federal spending, prior to the rise of the welfare state. It was amazingly bigger than it is now. So you start with that. Uh, I hope, I, I have no inside knowledge of this, I hope that Trump is gonna propose a very large and very intense infrastructure program. I mean, it's, it's clear if we're gonna compete in the world market that we have to profoundly, from, from our ports, to our railroads, to our highways, to our pipelines, we have to profoundly reshape how the investment strategy I think that also means you have to have a lot of deregulation. Uh, there's a guy named Howard Phillip that some of you may know. Uh, I'm sorry, Philip Howard, who, who some of you may know, who's written extensively on deregulation, estimates 
that you could, by simply establishing one federal office for everything, so you didn't have to go to multiple offices for studies, uh, that you could take two thirds of the time out of building things. Uh, you had an example here on the Oakland Bridge when the, when the gas truck blew up, they waived all the normal requirements. They got it done under budget ahead of schedule. You had it in Southern California at the Northridge earthquake where Wilson waived all the requirements ahead of schedule under budget. Levitt did the same thing for the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. Uh, Mitch Daniel did it by selling the interstate, taking the capital from the interstate, using it out totally outside federal regulations, built bridges across the Ohio River faster, cheaper, et cetera. And Casey did the same thing by selling the state liquor uh, stores and taking uh, part of that money and applying it to highways outside federal regulations. So we know you could do it, but between the unions and the environmentalists and, and people who love bureaucracy, I mean, the fight you're gonna have to try to say, yes, I'll agree to put a trillion dollars in if you'll agree to let me do it in a common sense, practical way. That's an uphill fight because a lot of people would rather not have the money <coughs> spent at all than, than break up the kind of system they built. Just, we're having this uh, debate in Sacramento uh, on the same issue where Governor Brown, uh, at our urging, has, uh, has proposed uh, an opportunity for housing to be built by right, meaning that if it's zoned for the housing, you could just build it uh, under most circumstances rather than having to go through yet another process uh, where folks get an opportunity to oppose it. And housing is a really big issue here, and it is, it's definitely the fight of our time in Sacramento, the biggest one well, we've seen. But, but think about the equity issue. I mean, I, I, when we did the 96 convention in San Diego, I'd done a lot of work with Habitat for Humanity, so we thought naively, we'll build a Habitat house in San Diego, which we did. We paid more for the permits <laughs> than you pay for the house in Georgia. And frankly, the people of San Diego wanted it that way because it kept poor people out. I mean, let's be honest here when we, talk, when we talk about what some of the problems are. They didn't particularly want to have that housing. I, I had dinner one, one night with Jerry when he was the mayor of Oakland. And he was commenting, he had just gone down and talked to the Environmental Law Division of the State Bar Association about the fact that when he, the first time he was governor, uh, he went a little overboard on some of the environmental stuff. And he said, He's trying to explain that he wants to develop the Oakland port area. And they're saying, well, you have to go through an elaborate environmental study. And he's saying, have any of you visited the Oakland port? Are you crazy? There's nothing there that, to study. It is a total disaster. And I think that's the kind of stuff we're up against. It takes longer for the Corps of Engineers to study the dredging of Charleston Harbor than it took to build the new larger Panama Canal. That's the kind of stuff we're up against. Now we have to be careful because half the room are environmental lawyers. <laughs> this is a big business in the Bay Area. As our chairman, Mr. Covarrubias and Mr. Shannon know, uh, you know, this is big business in the Bay Area. So look, look I'm, I'm so committed to finding a way out of this stuff. I'm even willing to pay for, for retraining for lawyers. I mean, I realize <laughs> <laughs> we, we may need that if, if that was the outcome. So l let's turn it over, you know, today is election day and it has been an unusual uh, process to say the least. And the Republican candidate, Mr. Trump, seems to be in <coughs> even more trouble than usual today. I, I think Senator Kirk from Illinois, if I'm correct, pulled out his support saying, I just can't vote under these circumstances. You know, you, you've commented on, I think, both sides of the Donald Trump issue. What's going on and what can we glean from this? What's going to happen? Big question, but it's, it's on everybody's mind. Well, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm glad to be out here on primary day, and I'm actually gonna do Hannity from out here later on this evening, uh, because it's just, it, it will be interesting to see what happens. My, my instinct is that Clinton will probably win by a narrow but real margin, and that'll pose an interesting challenge for Sanders, uh, who I think will stay in to the convention, in part because he's not gonna pull out before the FBI pulls out. Uh, and I think his attitude is just, you know, tell me why it's to my advantage to cave, but I think he loses a lot of psychological momentum, whereas if he won out here, I think he'd have huge momentum. And um, my guess is just looking at the various pieces of data that she ought to pull this out by three to five points. Uh, Trump will win out here as, as he's gonna win everywhere. Um, and, and, and this, I mean, we can talk about Sanders and, and Clinton, and I know a little bit about the Democratic Party. 
But, but I think actually historically, although the rise of Sanders is something you need to really pay attention to because it is a permanent shift to the left of a very significant part of the American system and particularly for people under 35. I mean, the degree to which uh, the crisis of 2008 uh, and the, the incompetence of the Bush administration shattered a belief in capitalism is very real and is, in a sense, and is now really beginning to manifest itself. Uh, and and uh, now there's a counter to it. I talked to some 25 college students at the American Enterprise Institute the other afternoon. I just said to them, how many of you would rather have the US government taxi bureaucracy than Uber? Mm -hmm. And there were zero. The minute you actually go from, oh, I'm, I'm, socialism sounds interesting to you too could be Venezuela, you begin to suddenly strip away the socialists just as the Swiss just repudiated a guaranteed minimum wage on the grounds that it, led to, it would lead to robotics and the block on employment of, all, of every low skilled worker in, in Switzerland. And once people thought it through, they said, yeah, that'd be stupid. And they voted it down, although it sounded really great going in. But, but socialism nonetheless, and, and the various aspects of socialism are all stronger today than they were a year ago. And in that sense, Sanders is a significant long-term historic figure, which also means there's a much bigger anti-Israel movement inside the Democratic Party than there was a year ago. Because it's integral to the left. Uh, so that's, that'll be interesting to see how that works out. And I suspect that the most bitter platform fight in the Democratic Party in, in Philadelphia will be over Israel. Um, on the Republican side, you have something very different. And I think it's so different that nobody can even write about it coherently yet. You had 17 candidates. By any reasonable standard, if you talk about Scott Walker, Jeb Bush, uh, Ted Cruz, uh, John Kasich, uh, uh, you know Mar Marco Rubio, you you wouldn't or Chris Christie, I mean, you wouldn't have said these people were lightweights. You wouldn't have walked in and said, "Boy, you guys have such a weak bench. Some total outside entrepreneur is going to win because the vacuum." So, but you would have said this is actually one of the one of the strongest and deepest fields the Republican Party has ever fielded. And that's what people thought in January of 2015. I, I was in Iowa at the first big coming out party for uh, Scott Walker, which was a conservative national security summit. Uh, Trump was also there. And um, at that moment, it looked like, you know, Scott Walker was on the way to being a serious candidate. And then he just collapsed. And so you have this fascinating phenomenon that there was a new game emerging, and it was actually emerging, I think, and I'm making this up a little bit, but because but I, I, I think about this a lot because I don't understand it. I think it was actually emerging in, in, in three parallel forms. First, there is a, a totally new social media capability that nobody really understands yet. And, and you had a little bit of it done uh, by, by, the, by Jeb, George W. Bush, you had a lot more of it, and you had some of it done with Howard Dean and MoveOn.org in 2004. Then you had it accelerated by, by Obama. But, but all of those were organized, directed uses of data in a different way than what we're now seeing. What you're now seeing is a country where the percent of young people who live on their mobile devices, uh, the, number, the number who no longer take television. I mean, there, there are all sorts of things going on out there that are restructuring the patterns of information. So just as Andrew Jackson really helped invent the weekly newspaper as a political force to get around the old establishment, and you had uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who really used, and actually, by the way, Lincoln in passing did the same thing with the daily newspaper, which is why the Lincoln-Douglas debates become so important. Then Roosevelt invents the, the fireside <laughs> chat on radio to get past the existing media. And now you have Trump. And Trump is the first politician who's understood that you can literally live in the sea of media. I tell people, he's the first person to, to understand the Kardashian culture. And it's part of why he gets away with saying things that are utterly stupid, because they disappear, because they're replaced by the next thing. And, and the system just devours stuff. Uh, so that, that's part one, over here is, is the systemic change that, that Sanders understood enough to raise money with it. But Sanders doesn't really live in it. Trump lives in it. That's why he tweets. 
That's why he Facebooks. Uh, that's why he, you know, does, he calls into all the TV shows because he understands also once you're a big enough celebrity, you are by definition a celebrity. Therefore, the media will cover you. Since they'll cover you, you're an even bigger celebrity by definition. So then they have to cover you. And the, the case, the test case to me, which I was amazed by, was I think it was the Florida primary, where Trump does this hour and 15 minute gig with Trump wine, Trump water, Trump steaks, partly answering Romney's attack that he hadn't ever created businesses. But if you watch it, you realize he's toying with the media. He's saying to the media, I can be so amusing doing nothing of substance that you can't leave. I have, you're trapped. And the proof was when Hillary gave her victory speech that night, not a single channel switched to Hillary. And the reason is simple, in the age of clickers, they would have lost half their audience because they would have said, I wonder where Trump is. So here's this guy who's doing junk, but, it, but it's reality TV. It's such weird drunk, and you wonder, what is he gonna do next? You know, are, are three baboons coming out? Is, is, is a tiger coming out? I mean, you know, I've, I've said publicly, I wouldn't be at all shocked if he entered the convention on Thursday night on an elephant. I mean, who knows what he's going to do? You know, but what he knows is, and none of us understood this, what he knew was if he absorbed all the oxygen in the room, candidates would just die. Because they couldn't buy enough, even Bush with all of his money, couldn't buy enough advertising to replace the social media. So the social media is, is, is a big piece of what was happening. <clears throat> the second piece that was happening is Trump, Trump is the first candidate, uh, Perot was sort of a forerunner of this, but Trump's the first candidate who really articulates blue collar high school graduate fears about America. And there I really strongly recommend Charlie Murray's book, uh, Coming Apart, which is a, Murray wrote, the most important book on welfare reform called Losing Ground in the mid 80s. It was, it was central to being able to reform welfare because it so decisively proved that, that encouraging dependency was destructive. Uh, he now came back and last year wrote this book, which really describes the rise of what he calls super zip codes. Now I'll let you describe, define how many of you think you live in a super zip code. Top 5% of the country in income, top 5% of the country in education. You have to be both. And he starts by taking three, co th three very simple schools, Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Where do they live and who do they marry? They tend to overwhelmingly marry people from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. And what do they say to their kids? You gotta go to a really good school and do really well because you've gotta get into Harvard, Yale, or Princeton, otherwise you're a failure. And so what you have now emerging is this, this upper class that's an income education upper class that is totally uprooted from the rest of the country. Uh, we, we did a piece, uh, Ross Worthington is here, is my, my <coughs> co-author on many fun things and thinking about a lot of things. And I might say, by the way, a Brown graduate so he can speak as an insider <laughs> about the Ivy League. But we did a piece the other day on, on first world problems versus real world problems. I'm an Emory graduate. Some of you may remember a few weeks ago a vicious fascistic personality seeking to harm young people late at night wrote Trump 2016 in uh, uh, chalk on a sidewalk at Emory, leading 40 students to write a joint letter to the president of Emory saying that their sense of safety had been shattered, mm. that they no longer felt comfortable, and they feared the kind of aggressiveness that writing in chalk late at night implied. <laughs> <laughs> now, the idiotic first step of the president, who later recanted after three days, was to actually respond positively, to say they were gonna use the security cameras to find who did it, and to offer group therapy for anyone who felt so threatened by this that they had to be taken care of and nurtured. <laughs> now, when I go on college campuses, I always start by saying, I want to warn all of you, I'm going to describe macroaggressions. I don't have time for microaggressions, so I'm going straight to macroaggressions. And I usually start with ISIS and the fact that they want to cut off your head. Now, if we can start up here with a real world problem, then later on you can have angst. 
But this is, so what you get with Trump is a guy who, of course, violates all the norms of the top of, the, of what Murray calls the super zips, which is all of you. I mean, he talks, he talks in a four, at a fourth grade level, quite deliberately. He, talk, he says things you're not allowed to say. And a, and a friend of mine said, if you, if you watch the movie Invincible, which is about the blue collar worker in Philadelphia who tried out for the Eagles and actually played in the NFL for three years. It's a true story. Mark Wahlberg plays him. The opening part of the movie is a bar in South Philadelphia. And, it's the, and I grew up my, in, in, in Harrisburg, and I had relatives in Steelton, Pennsylvania. I knew exactly this kind of bar. This is the kind of bar where Joey comes in wearing a yellow sweater. So he says, Joey, you're a coward. No, you're wearing yellow. What's wrong with you? And then three other guys go, let's pick on Joey afternoon. And they all pal on Joey. Well, Trump is that guy. Trump's the guy who knows how to go right at you and sell low energy jab. I, I don't know why he has low energy. I've, I've worried about him. <laughs> they actually had Jeb running in New Hampshire to prove he had high energy. <laughs> I mean, do you know how stupid this is? And then you get to little Marco. And little Marco falls for it. And this is the key thing to remember. Yeah. Television values authenticity. You can make mistakes. You can be clumsy. If they think you're real, they will tolerate a lie. Marco Rubio trying to fight is not real. Marco Rubio being happy, positive, taking us to a better future is totally real. And if you go back and look at the video of Marco trying to fight, it's painful. I, um, I did Bill O'Reilly one night when there were still six or seven candidates. And he said, why don't they take Trump head on? And I said, Bill, Trump is the grizzly bear in the revenant. You wake him up. He bites off your face. He sits on you and claws you for a while. And then he goes back and he goes to sleep. Now, everybody else who watches the Grizzly Bear do that goes, not me. I mean, I, no. Why don't you go fight him? <laughs> At which point, in one of his weirder moments, O'Reilly goes, you know, that bear should have won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. And I point out it was a computer generated bear, but still. But the point is, Trump, which is the third part, if the first part is a pure use of social media, the second part is the willingness to say the, un the unsayable in a way that resonates for 40 or 50 percent of the country or more. And then the third part is Trump himself. I mean, I mean, this is a guy who's very, very clever. And he's been very clever his whole life. And if you read The Art of the Deal, which he wrote in the 80s, which was the number one bestseller for a year in the New York Times, cover of Time magazine in 89, Oprah Winfrey asking him in the 80s if he's going to run for president number one TV show in the country with The Apprentice, then spins off The Celebrity Apprentice, buys the Miss Universe program while opening up golf courses and hotels and casinos. And then people measure him because, you know, he, he never ran for Congress. <coughs> I mean, that's the Washington standard that says if, you're not, if you haven't done our game, you don't get to come play. And what, what makes Trump different is Trump just said, sure, I can. 